Noah team. Could you introduce the team that you were um, reading about uh, and summarize the process? Thank you. Do you want to start, Hita, or should I? Uh, can you? I will. Thank you. So uh, we were asked to, to examine a, a paper, a very interesting paper, about um, the Men's Resource Center uh, in Uganda, which is supported by Promundo, uh, founded by Miguel, uh, my other friend Gary Barker, a great program uh, in many different parts of the world. But the, the, the center in, in Rwanda, uh, working with Promundo and with the Ministry of Health in, uh, in Rwanda, wanted to create a... Um, uh, uh, an intervention that worked with men on gender issues. I, I thought that one of the most telling parts of the, the story is that generally when we use words like gender, there's a tendency to think that this is a project that's about women. Um, and when in, in the communities where the, 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 the project had been working traditionally, when the word gender came up, it seemed as if it was in favor of women and often, uh, in fact, to the detriment of men. And so the challenge of this group that Emmanuel here is, is representing was to, to say that, yes, of course, when you're talking about gender, it's a very positive thing for, uh, for women, but it's also a very positive thing for men. Um, that uh, as we, have it, we say uh, very often here in Brazil, that machismo, uh, male dominance, hurts men as well. It doesn't just hurt women and hurts women more, uh, but it, it, it also hurts men. And they, they made a list of all the different areas in which this sort of, this machismo uh, was hurting men in, in Rwanda as well. And so the project um, had a, a, a very interesting series of work based upon a model that Promundo had created here in Brazil. Uh, and that worked on, basically, it started off with a pilot of a smaller number of, uh, of meetings between volunteers, uh, local leaders, and, uh, and fathers. Then used those meetings and the feedback from those to create a, a much larger curriculum that was eventually scaled up to have uh, a series of 17 meetings. If I'm, I'm, if I'm making a mistake, Miguel and, uh, and, and Emmanuel, please tell me. But as I recall, it was that there were uh, seven meetings with just men, where men would talk about gender, uh, would then go home and often talk with their partners, their wives, uh, girlfriends, uh, whoever they were they were living with, and their children, and then come back. And then the, there would be ten meetings at the end, where it would be the, the the couples working together. And the ideas were to examine and to challenge the roles of gender. The results are really powerful. Uh, it was it was great to see all of the different areas of that. I'm I'm actually going to call up the paper here because it was so uh, so impressive that um that we see uh lowered rates of physical punishment uh lower use of parental alcohol use lower use of um intimate uh partner violence and a reduction of male dominance in high household decision making more contraceptive use more perceptive of men, uh, more participation of men in unpaid child care antenatal care and, high, and household work and increased time spent with their children these are exactly the sort of things that anybody who was working with children and especially with gender are looking for. And so the fact that they were able to do this was extraordinary. The paper then goes on to talk about some of the challenges of scaling, and that's going to be where some of our questions come from. Uh, because when it's done by a group of volunteers within an intimate relationship with the, the Men's Resource Center and with, uh, and with Promundo, it was one situation. Uh, and then when it was implemented by health agents uh, paid by the government, it became a different issue. Um, nonetheless, it is now extended to reach about 10,000 uh, parents in, uh, in several regions of, of Rwanda. So there's a, a summary of a, a very interesting project working with small groups of men and then of couples to help them to challenge the way that gender um, makes life difficult for both men and for women. But uh, we have a couple of questions, and maybe Hita can start off with uh, with those, so that we can direct those to to Emmanuel. I I found the the project very powerful and um, very important too, because in Brazil we have the same problem. A man is uh, 
very aggressive and uh, many programs are not paying attention in men. And I think that's so important to start to, well, Pramundo is working here too. And um, I think that's very important. I have a question is just how, uh, I would like to know how you uh, address uh, with the question of uh, being the man, again, the, uh, the most, uh, the protagonist, because we know in, in uh, the uh, many cases uh, is the uh, being the, the principal uh, caring person, uh, is uh, normally addressed to the woman, but at the same time, so, um, I don't know if I, I have the, uh, the correct question, but it's how you uh, can manage the idea of woman being also protagonist, carrying babies, she and, uh, and not, um, Maybe you can help me, Kurt, because I think I have the question, but I am not tr translating well. This is a very complex question that Heath and I were spending a lot of time talking about. Um, and per perhaps I can start with a metaphor. Um, Heath and I are, are uh, we were also the parents of a, of a young daughter. We live together. We've been married for a long time. And one of the things that we find very interesting and challenging is that if, if Hita does something that is associated with traditional female gender roles, whether that's cooking a great meal, uh, whether that's doing something wonderful for our daughter, that she is just, okay, that's, that's, thing, that's how things are. But if I do exactly the same thing, I cook a nice meal for guests, I do a good job as a father, that everybody says, oh, you're so wonderful. And that's really tremendously sexist. And so one of the challenges that we think is very important to think about with projects that work with parents is how is it that you can encourage the participation of men without men suddenly colonizing the space that had been for women, where women can feel as if they are also valued in this process. And it seems as if, at least in the description, that the interviews that you did at the very beginning with women about what it is that women want from this process was very important, but we wanted to hear more about that. And the other thing that I wanted to hear about, uh, if I may ask a, a second question, is the question, it, was, it emerged very much at the end about the, uh, how COVID has changed the project. And the, the paper relates how COVID has been really important in seeing how important village leaders and village elders are in the process. That most of it had been done through, first through volunteers, then through uh, community health workers. But this saw the, the importance of, um, of village leaders. Um, and so we wanted to ask a little bit more about how that came about and how it is that you see the importance of these, uh, these village leaders. Then there was one final thing that we wanted to ask about, uh, which is, let me call it up here. Um, when, it, apparently in the pilot, um, some of the facilitators, the community leaders who, who and volunteers were midwives and, and nurses. And that when it was changed and scaled to be the, uh, the, 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 the health ministry that was doing the project, this was then done by local community health agents. I'm sure that there's a gender issue there. I don't know enough about Rwanda to say, but generally midwives uh, are, is a feminine role. Um, and very often community health workers can be both men and women. And so we wanted to know as the facilitators of the process, the, the people who work with the, the young parents, the, the young couples, as the gender is different, how does that express itself? How do you see the changes when the facilitator is a man or a woman? We saw that very strongly in our work in the Amazon. And so we wanted to know uh, how you perceived the positive and, and negative aspects of both men and women participating in that role. Thank you for those really interesting questions. Um, we are going to be going a little bit chat chat through time. So I invite uh, the Ramwet team to answer those questions, but be ready for me to cut you off and move on. 
Um, this is the beginning of this conversation. Those questions are still there. They still deserve an answer. So I encourage you guys to go beyond this particular meeting in this dialogue and um, to share your thoughts beyond this particular meeting too. But for now, Emmanuel and, um, and, and can I find you on my screen? And Kate, there you are. Um, I invite you to respond um, to those questions. Take whichever one you would like to start with, and um, thank you. Go thank ahead, you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Penny. Thank you for the interesting question. Uh, let's start maybe with the working with the village leaders. Uh, despite maybe Kate will help me to how we work the. We encourage the men to work together with the women to promote gender equality. The, in Rwanda, the lowest level of, of administrative entity is the village. And the, the village leaders are managing the, almost the, a cup of community members. And they are leading many things because they are elected by the fellow community members. Working with them was uh, to create an enabling environment whereby the group education for fathers or for couples and even the work of community health workers was made very easy because they are supported by the local leaders, more especially the village leaders. Uh, once they, they are involved, they are supportive to the program, to the community health workers, to the group education. And uh, sometimes they support us to provide the training rooms, the venues, and even to mobilize the, 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 the community members to join the group and even to avoid the dropouts. Working with them was a, a, a milestone because they are very supportive either to the program and even to the community and even to the facilitators. And uh, we worked with the volunteer, the, the second question. In the pilot phase, we worked, we worked with the volunteers uh, who are selected by the program among the community, among the community members. But with this scale up, we, the government of Rwanda, in collaboration with Rwanda and Promundo, decided to use the existing health structure composed of the community health workers. Of course, some are men, others are women. And the, the group education that we are working with are working as they are facilitating the group as two community health workers. It might be maybe both men or both women or men and women at the same time. But the, when a the, when the facilitator is a female uh, who is facilitating the parent education group, it is not a big deal because they have been trained and empowered to, to conduct the group education session based on different scenario and Areas. In during this scale up, we realized that we we thought that it will be not easy when a woman is facilitating maybe a group of men, but it was not the case uh, because not only the the the, the emphasis made during the the, the, the training, uh, but also when they are the two, they support they are support they support each, each other to handle those small issues related to gender uh, dynamic within the group. Most of the time it worked well. Uh, I would say some challenges are available related to those dynamic, but the trend is not very high because of the training, because of the refresher training, because of the meeting whereby we train those community workers and empower them to respond to some issues raised by the community members. 
Maybe Kate can go ahead for to compliment me before we talk about maybe on the COVID and the, even how we work with the men and women at the same time. Can I, can I, Kate, could I ask you to address the COVID issue and then we'll have to move on. And the other key question about why do men get praised and women not? That's my translation of it. <laughs> I think might be, could be taken into the breakout groups. So anyway, <laughs> Kate, COVID. Um, <clears throat> well, I think if the, the question had been about COVID and the, the village leaders, if I'm, if I'm correct. So I think Emmanuel might have sort of addressed that a bit. Um, so I'm looking at Kurt and, and Rita to see if, you, so maybe I'll touch very quickly then on, um, maybe just to emphasize that I think research and sort of formative research, but also research throughout the program has been really critical at understanding first, like how would women like men to be involved? What are their fears about men maybe taking control, getting praise? How do men want to be involved? So that really definitely informed the whole adaptation to the Rwandan context, but then has been something that we've been following up on over time as well, like through the RCT to understand, you know, is men being more engaged in their children's lives having any detrimental impacts on women's power, control, decision making, etc. And, you know, thus far we've seen only positive results, but qualitatively we've also really tried to follow up to make sure that women, you know, are appreciating men's greater engagement um, <clears throat> in their children's lives and, and in, within the family. Um, and so I think Another related issue is we've also been following up on the issue of the gender dynamics and, you know, how do participants like or not like being facilitated by potentially two women, whereas the original program was facilitated only by men. Um, so we've been following up to, you know, really understand how that makes facilitators feel, how that makes participants feel, um, to know whether or not it's, it's working or not. Um, and then very quickly, I'll say, and maybe we can chat more in the breakout rooms and things, that I think this issue of praise is something that we've seen, but mostly only sort of at the health facility level. So being praised for, you know, taking a child for vaccination, for accompanying a partner to antenatal care, family planning, but more at the community level. And, you know, Emmanuel can better report on this than I can, but what we've seen is more a little bit of pushback. You know, it, it's not necessarily praised to be doing these things. And so it's actually something that there can be pushed back both against the woman because she might be seen as failing in some way because her partner is taking on these roles um, or pushed back against the man because he's failing at his, you know, expected gender role. So I think it's, um, that's sort of more of what we've seen, but, but at the health facility level, we have indeed seen that sort of praising and, and potentially, you know, men getting uh, fast tracked and things like that to, to get services when they're accompanying a partner or bringing a child. So I'll wrap there. Thank you very much. Um, and while you still have the floor, could you now move us on? I'm sure there are some common themes that are going to come out of the piece that you read. So please take us through Ramrek, the, the, the case study that you read. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Uh, 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 me and Kate were, have been assigned to present on the side of the Promundo engaging fathers and changing norms in the perspective of the creation and development of the program P. In summary, the program P, Pi and Pedro in Spanish and in, in, in Portuguese, uh, which means fathers started in Brazil with the aim to advancing gender equality, promoting health masculinity, reducing gender-based violence and improving the well-being of a family by engaging men in active fatherhood during the partner's pregnancies and children area age by using fathers as an entry point for exploring gender norms and traditional uh, behavior. Um, we are on, honored to be with Miguel, who is the founder 
of program P, program H, program M. And the, the, while the program was started in, in, in Brazil, now it is adopted in more than, in many countries, including my country, whereby we are using the program P with a small adaptation, but with the quality and the fidelity because the original content is still the, the same. The program P uh, module provides strategy, exercise, and the activities to engage actively fathers and the couples, but also promote support in the designing and the organizing the campaign to involve men in child development and in healthcare providers with the two tools to engage men around maternal, newborn, child and family health. And uh, currently 18 countries are using the, the model. And the, the model shifts from the child health to men's engagement when uh, I was saying that we are honored to be with Miguel Fontes, who is the founder, the founder of Promundo and the, the program P, program H, and the program M. Initially, he funded the Global Orphan Program to help children orphaned by the HIV and the AIDS, but also to advocate for government to make more accessible the medication for HIV and the AIDS for children. The great achievement that have been achieved against HIV AIDS in the Promundo shift from the global orphan program and expand the focus on supporting children and the empowering the community. Later, Miguel was joined by Gary and create a gender equality program for men using the program H. As I said, the program P is for couples, the program H is for men, and the program M is for women and the girls, which provide the safe space for women and, and, and men to challenge their own social culture and belief and uh, discuss about the positive change. Later, the program was uh, embedded in, in the Minister of the Health program. And uh, now the program P is used by the Minister of the Health in different activities for healthcare providers on fatherhood and men engagement. And uh, for instance, it has been adopted with many countries and uh, it is gaining the wide uh, dissemination in a different country and uh, it is uh, bringing the positive results. Maybe Kate can help me to talk about the Promundo and the work of Program P with indigenous people, because it has been used during the COVID-19, but also it has been used for the indigenous people. If Kate is on board, she can maybe help me to talk about it. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Emmanuel. Um, and I think full transparency, I also am working with Promundo, but uh, through the US office. And my work has, has really focused on sort of sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So it's it was very interesting for me to read more about, you know, some of the original work um, in Brazil and, and some of the ongoing work. And so sort of our questions, maybe not necessarily for clarity, but we'd love to hear a little bit more from Miguel about is some of the newer adaptations adaptations of Program P um, that are mentioned in the case study to riverside communities and to indigenous communities in the Amazon. And I think <clears throat> particularly 
we're curious to know a little bit more about how that collaboration started. You know, I, I'm sort of how was it uh, beginning? Um, and what are you learning through that process in terms of how adaptation is different? Um, you know, the brief mentions, yeah, you know, adapting to culture and language and traditions um, and really being led by um, those communities in the process. So we'd just love to hear a little bit more about what you're learning through that process and how it's been different. So much, Emmanuel and, and Kate and, uh, and Rita and Kurt, now you know why I was so fascinated by your experience in the Amazon. Uh, there are a couple of comments on the questions that are uh, brought by Emmanuel and Kate that I would like to address. Uh, the first one is regarding uh, all of these interventions uh, that deal with sustainability through public policy. That's why uh, Promundo is a Brazilian uh, civil society organization. We are now based in Brasilia really to work together and we have offices in, in Rio to really scale up into the public uh, policy system. So we are working uh, in the health sector and also in the social protection sector. But one thing that is very important is that we start up, up by questioning machismo. That, that's the main mainstream issue that we address in all of our methodologies. This is the first one. Uh, so we don't work with fathers to be better fathers. We work with fathers to give a new meaning to masculinity and gender equality. This is very important because it's not just an issue to provide them with the skills. There are uh, sessions on skills for caring, but we start up when we do trainings with the health sector um, uh, workers, with the social protection workers, with the education workers, to give them the full understanding uh, how harmful is machismo to men themselves. Uh, this is quite, quite important as a, the mainstream message here. This was, I call myself a uh, 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 machista in permanent disconstruction because this is how I was raised. And this is what we are trying to bring to people. And child development, it's a key window of opportunity to question uh, all of that and to normalize gender equality to the extent that men will feel much better for themselves. So uh, we are doing uh, some research and with program P and showing clearly the impact on men seeking more uh, health services after they go through program P. They're looking more for their uh, physical aspects and mental aspects of improving uh, their own lives. This is very important. Now with the indigenous and riverside uh, populations, just very quickly, uh, program P or any other methodology that Pramundo have is divided in four uh, components. The first component is training of facilitator, um, health workers, social protection workers. The second one is social mobilization of families, and engagement of men. The third is participation men's group. And the fourth is impact evaluation. This is how we do uh, our methodologies. If that's, as Emmanuel said, program P, program M, program H, program P, all these beautiful uh, soup letters uh, that we have. But with the indigenous and riverside, it touch on exactly what Hita and Kurt understood. We have an initial stage with it, which is listening, uh, co-producing really having one beforehand in any community that we work, not start with training, <laughs> start with listening, start with their values, with their culture, with what they understand about gender. And we don't even say about gender equality. They say what fatherhood is and they teach us. And through a uh, concept of Paulo Freire, by teaching us, they learn as well the importance of the development aspects that Kurt and Hita uh, address in their project as well. So that's what I think it was so important to work with traditional populations now, because that's the way we proceed. We are really trying to develop this listening component at all times, how to really address uh, the, the beautiful values, traditions of these populations. And through that, going then through the other stages of the process and really looking at child development indicators such as 
infant mortality, malnutrition, and all these aspects. Not so much focusing on gender equality per se, but focusing on the child development aspect. Thank you. Well, thank you all three of you. And that was a very nice circle that we came round with. Started off in South America, ended up back in South America um, through a connection. Well, we're going to be moving into the breakout groups shortly, but we do have with us today Munira Rashid, who was on a Saving Brains program some time back and has published on community engagement issues. Munira, you can I invite you to um, ask your question of all three groups, and then we will ask the breakout groups to reflect on what you feel, given what you've heard from each of these groups, how they might actually answer this particular question that you're, you're posing to them. Munira? Sure. Thank you very much, Penny, and thank you for all the three case studies. I also read them um, in detail. And my question and comment is actually, it seems like you were very mindful of the processes that lead to community engagement like ownership. And a deliberate effort was made to ensure so. What I would like to know is, uh, were there any practical challenges to implementing the approach? And I'm also typing the question in uh, in the chat. I'm, whoops, I'm struggling here to, to reshare my screen um, because um, Jasmine is going to uh, explain the breakout groups. So thank you, Manira, for your question. And I will reshare my screen so that you can all see the questions also for the breakout groups. Jasmine. everyone. Um, I'm going to place us into breakout groups. So we'll have around uh, 25 minutes uh, to spend together and to discuss. Yeah, Penny's putting the two questions up. Um, yeah, and just before just before that, I just wanted to, to share quickly that we'll um, we'll have our next webinar on November 3rd. Um, and uh, that one will be looking at another, uh, featuring another innovator and their experiences with uh, stakeholder, um, their stakeholder ecosystem. So stay tuned for that and more details. And we'll have this recording from this webinar um, going out to everyone as well. Um, and I think, I, Penny, have you already shared a little bit about the, the website and the case brief? I have indeed, yes, inviting okay. people to, to land there and to share more information there. Um, okay, perfect. So in addition to these two key questions, Manera has placed another question in the chat. Um, I hope. Yep, indeed, it yeah, is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm ready to launch the breakout whenever. And uh, we have, I think, um, about 25 minutes, Jasmine. Yeah, I, and then... I put in 23 minutes. <laughs> yeah, 23 minutes, and then we'll all meet back um, in the central room. And thank you all very much for sharing both your, your cases and your reflections on other people's cases. Okay, see you soon. You see soon. Okay, brilliant. Welcome back, everybody. Do we have everybody with us that's still here? So, as I, I want to to again thank everybody for sharing, both for sharing your original stories, the teams that have been joining us, for taking the time to really read carefully the, the narratives of others and sharing that with us. That was very powerful for me and the questions that you brought up. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and sharing your thoughts in the breakout rooms. And I had a very fascinating time with mine. And I'd like you to have a look at this uh, final question to each of you that we invite you to place in the chat. We also are interested in ensuring that, um, that we get feedback 
from how this, the content has been shared, how the narratives have been shared and how we've, uh, how we've been designing our webinars. So um, we'll put that link to an evaluative questionnaire into the chat. We'll also send you the link through the follow-up uh, webinar. So um, a moment or two to think about how you want to respond to this question and looking forward to seeing what you say in the chat and perhaps some, some comments that might come out of that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going, I don't know if you can still see my screen, but I'm, I've got a crib sheet here. I'm gonna copy paste that. Um, are we going, oops, now I've lost it. I've lost it, I've lost it. Well, um, where is the slide? Um, um, um. Jasmine, I'm gonna need you to manage my inability to manage myself. Right. So I'm just scrolling down what people are writing here. So there's, there's quite a wide variety of different thoughts. So um, when you've written yours and you're having a look, if anything grabs you, please unmute yourself and, and, and point it out. The, the word co-creation, collaboration comes up a lot. But thinking of Munira's question, there are challenges to that being real. Um, how are people addressing that? So Menelik has brought up the issue about starting very early on and even the identification of what needs to be looked at. Thank you, Randy. It's kind of can you share these comments with us later on? Please. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So we've, we've got a lot of, that, of comments that seem to suggest that we don't start. So one of the challenges is not starting early enough in the process. Um, 
another theme that seems to be coming up is 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 being aware of the the strengths of the community that you're going into um, being aware of your own strengths um, Arty points out there about making change step by step, not rushing in. Thank you, Mark. Nice to see you. There's a, there's a definition here about how the community is beyond, beyond, um, I mean, it, how it stretches into local governance. So there's comments about bringing in local leaders. Thank you, Patricia. Good to have you with us and for your thoughts. So that so yes, another theme is about is about listening and understanding other other points of view. So thank you all for sharing those points. Yes, we will be putting them together in a document. You can take your time reading over other people's reflections and seeing where yours fit into that. Um, I, I put in the link to, to an evaluative questionnaire. Um, and now I'm trying to do it for a second time because it's so way up above. Um, there we go, thank you, Jess. So as you drift off, we would really please, I know filling out service is such a pain, but we really would value your feedback. It's not very long, um, but it would be very helpful. So if you could click on that link um, and, and fill it out for us, and uh, we'll see you all next month. So thanks again, folks. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, Jasmine, for organizing this. Emmanuel, very nice to meet you and, uh, and uh, everyone else as well. And Thank don't you. forget that the conversation started. Don't let it end here. If any of the questions that, that came up in today are you feel require following up on, please make sure that, that we can at least facilitate that happens. Thank you. Thank you.